So I know this seems basic to a lot of people, but it took me a couple years to learn this tip. Whenever you're stringing up your fly rod before you start fly fishing, typically in the beginning, I would try to bring the tapered leader through the little eyes and a lot of times they'd either lose a handle and have to start all over or I would even miss a guide because it's kind of hard to see the monofilament while you're running it through the guides. So a little trick, fold the fly line, the floating line, kind of in a U shape and bring that through the guides and carry the tapered leader along with it. That will help you string up this fly rod a whole lot easier the next time you're out there fly fishing. So there's your pro fly fishing tip of the trip. All right. Till the next time, everybody, fish on. We are live in my fly fishing room, and today we're gonna talk about tying tippet material to the end of your tapered leaders. We're gonna talk about some best practices, and I'm gonna show you a knot that is easier than tying your shoe. So easy to do. And shout out to one of the Fish On members who requested this video. If you're part of this group and you want me to film something, I'm going to do it for you. And here's the video today. Tapered leaders, right? Tapered leaders generally come at about a nine foot length. There are three reasons why you might want to tie tip it to the end of this tapered leader. One is you want to lengthen a nine foot tapered leader. So you can tie a length of tippet to the end of this tapered leader and make it 12 feet, 15 feet long, whatever you'd like. Or the second reason why you'd want to tie tippet to this tapered leader is if you've managed to get a wind knot in the tapered leader, you do want to cut that out and retie it. Anytime you have a wind knot, it's a weak point in your line. So cut that out and tie a piece of tippet onto that section you just cut off. And then finally, as you're cutting flies or cutting off flies, you're tying on a fly and you retie and you retie and you retie. That leader, that tapered leader gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually you might be down to about seven and a half feet. So you're gonna to wanna to pull off some of this tippet material to re-lengthen that tapered leader back to nine feet. This knot is easier than the knot you use to tie your shoes. So let's get into the tutorial and since I'm not feeling great right now, my voice isn't super strong, I'm gonna have a celebrity guest star do the voiceover as we tie this knot together. To tie a surgeon's knot, follow these steps. Hold the two ends of the leader and tippet material parallel to each other. With about a four inch overlap, create a closed loop by crossing one end over the other. Pass both ends through the loop twice. Finally, pull on both ends simultaneously to firmly tighten the knot. Cut off the excess tags and you're done. Let's do this. Fish on. All right, pro tip. So as you begin to cut more and more into this tapered leader, you're gonna get through the tippet section that's on this tapered leader and into the butt section. If you get too far into the butt section, you'll notice the line will start looking like 16 and 20 pound test. Generally, the knot strength lessens when you try to tie on something really thin to something really thick. So if you've gotten too far back into the butt section of this tapered leader, it's time to just get a new leader, right? Don't try to tie on some 20 pound test to a uh, you know six pound test. It's just not gonna work. It's not gonna hold. It's not gonna seat right. Well, hello there. Thanks for taking a moment to click on this video. And if you clicked on this video, you want to learn how to tie the nail knot. Now this particular knot is not a knot that you'll tie very often because today most fly lines come with a welded loop on one side and most tapered leaders today comes with a tied loop on one end, the thick end, the butt section of the tapered leader. And you just combine the two and away you go. But sometimes the welded loop will fail on the fly line. And that 
is where it's critical for you to understand how to tie this particular knot called the nail knot. And I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to tie fly line to a tapered leader using the nail knot. So let's get into the tutorial. Now, if you were a complete stud like my dad was, he used to be able to tie this knot with a couple of toothpicks or with a couple of sticks. But today we're lucky to have some tools that are specifically designed for the nail knot. One is just by itself, right? This tool right here is specifically for the nail knot. And there are other tools that have this particular nail knot tool built into it, like you see right here. So let's go through how to tie a nail knot. Don't mess me up. So we're gonna use the tool specifically designed for the nail knot for this tutorial. So you've got the end of your floating line that no longer has the loop. You're gonna to wanna to pull probably about a two and a half to three inch section beyond the tool or where your thumb goes. And there's a little flat spot there and you're gonna put your thumb firmly on that flat spot. Now you're gonna to wanna to grab the tapered leader that you're using and cut off the tied loop. That's gonna get in your way if you're gonna do this nail knot right to the fly line. So now I'm gonna reposition the floating line. Again, about two and a half, three inches. I like to have a little bit of a tag hanging off the end of that nail knot tool, and I'll show you why here at the end. And then opposite direction, put the thick butt portion of the tapered leader on that same flat surface and press down firmly with your thumb. Make sure that they stay together and everything's nice and tight. Now there's a little fork piece on this particular tool, which you're gonna start the wrap of your tapered leader. As you can see here, I'm going around and around and making sure the floating line stays in position, but I went around about five times and now I'm holding it with my index finger. Now bring the other end of the tapered leader, the tippet end of that tapered leader and run it through the little cave that you just created by tying those loops to the tool. Pull everything through carefully. Now sometimes the leader will want to bunch or twist, so you just kind of have to be careful and pull it all the way through until it's tight. Now here is the critical part of this tie. You gotta make sure that you're pressing down firmly with your thumb before pulling on the, the tapered leader to kind of bring that knot over to the fly line. It'll jump over and grab onto that fly line. That's why you wanna have at least two inches of fly line extending beyond that tool because that pull is a critical component. So press down very hard with your thumb on that flat spot of the tool and just give it a quick yank. Now you'll notice that the loops are not super tight. So you wanna go through and just kind of carefully tighten the loops together so everything seats well on the floating line and just keep kind of working it until all the loops are together. Pull everything tight. You can pull both the floating line and the tapered leader. You'll see everything cinch up super, super tight. Really yank on this thing to make sure it's seated well. And now cut the tag lines off and you've got yourself a nail knot. Now this is, again, this is super critical to know. You can certainly tie six or seven granny knots together on your floating line and tapered leader if you don't know how to tie this knot. But as soon as that gets into your guides, you're gonna lose that fish. This is a knot that you need to know just in case you're out there and you have a gear failure. So there you go. Now you know how to tie a nail knot. You're standing on the riverbank. You know there's fish in there. You've got an entire pack full of flies. You got a fly box open, also full of flies. What do you use? What do you use? Trust me, I have been there before. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about 40 years of experience fly fishing, right? And how do you overcome this? How do you overcome the anxiety that I once felt that I know you're probably feeling when trying to choose the right fly when fishing your favorite river? Let's get into it. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful fish. Wow. Yeah, that's a good fish. You're finally out there on your favorite river. You've got your gear on, you got the fly rod in your hand, you got your sling pack on, you've got boxes and boxes of different flies, and you're thinking to yourself, what should I tie on? What could be biting? And when you look into your box, you see so many different patterns, right? Some that look great in the fly shop that maybe 
don't look so great now that they're in your fly box. You're trying to find out, looking around in the water, trying to see if there's any activity, any fish activity at all, any bugs coming out of the water, anything at all, so that you know what to tie on to potentially catch a fish. So how many of you can relate to that? Well, right here, I have kind of summarized everything that I've done over the past 40 years of fly fishing rivers. And the cool thing about being a channel member, if you're part of the Fish On member group here, I'm gonna send you a copy of this. And there's about 20 different pages that's on this particular document that highlights the different bugs during the different seasons that you might fish a river. And I went as far as to get you some pictures and names of these bugs as well. So it'll kind of help you narrow down what to tie on next the next time you're fishing your favorite river. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the different seasons, some things to look for, some techniques that work, and most importantly, what flies do you tie on to find success in rivers? All right, so I am gonna refer to my notes because I did spend a lot of hours putting this together and there's so many nuances, right? When I first started this project, I thought, Wow, this is gonna be, this is gonna be, uh, it really got myself thinking because I had to put some careful thought into what do I do during the winter times to find success? The springtime, the summer, the fall. And I kind of summarized it to a host of different things that have worked well for me. So now you can kind of have a strategy the next time you go out there, but there's so many nuances. I mean, you do have to pay attention to what's going on, right? Look at the water. If there's nothing happening, then you're probably going to have to go prospecting for some fish. And I'm going to give you some flies that work well in doing that. Or if you do see some bugs flying around or bugs coming off the water, then, you know, you might have an idea. If you look down into the river and you see some things stuck on the rocks, right, that might be something you want to tie on. So just pay attention. But if you don't see anything going on, this is a great way to start. And a big shout out to Bill. He's the one that inspired me to put this together. And I got some feedback from him. I sent it to him first just to make sure that's what he was looking for. And he was thrilled about receiving this. So thanks again, Bill, for your input and, and inspiration in putting this together. So let's start off in the winter. It's winter time right now. And I have found some success this winter. Not as much as I'd like, but I have found some success this winter. So let's talk about some of the techniques to use when fishing rivers in the winter time. So... Love it or hate it, right? It's time to get the indicator out and start swinging nymphs. And did you know that nymphs can live in the river underwater for two to five years? And that's part of the reason why this particular fly is successful any time, any season, winter, spring, summer, or fall, because a lot of times that nymph's been underwater for a couple years before it's ready to hatch and fly away. Dragonfly nymphs can live up to five years in their nymph form. So kind of an interesting fact. So indicator setups with double nymphs. Why do you fish double nymphs? Because it gives you twice the chance of catching a fish. A lot of times I have a bigger fly on top and a smaller fly on the bottom separated between 12 and 18 inches of fly line. And that's always done well for me over the years when fly fishing a bobber setups is having two nymphs on there to kind of just increase your chances of finding the right one that that fish might want to eat. You also want to, we talked earlier about prospecting, you also want to vary your depth on the indicator, right? You'll get an idea sometimes how deep the river is. Sometimes you can't see down to the bottom, so you need to start prospecting. I always start shallow and I walk the fly out, meaning I'm casting right in front of my feet and then I continue to increase the length of the cast to kind of cover the entire river that I'm standing in front of in kind of a grid fashion. And then I'll vary the depth of the indicator until I find that sweet spot and catch a fish. A lot of times I'll stick with a certain depth for about 15 to 20 minutes before making a change. Streamers can also be very effective when fishing rivers in the winter months. A lot of times I prefer smaller jig leeches in natural colors and sculpin patterns, specifically the Sculpzilla, has always been my go-to. And remember, slower is a better presentation in the winter months. A lot of times these fish are not super active. They're kind of holding their ground and you want to be able to bring the fly right to them to entice that fish to bite, and they will, but you do have to have a slower presentation. Zip it by too quick. They're not in that big chase mode. They don't need to eat a lot of food to kind of sustain themselves in the winter months. 
So a slower presentation is key when you're fishing rivers in the winter months with these particular flies. So my recommended fly rods during the winter is a four, five, and six weights. Typically I'm using a five weight for most everything, but if you're fishing sinking lines when you're swinging those streamers, a lot of times a little heavier rod will do better for you. And you might wanna have a six weight with you that's set up with your full sink line. If you're fishing a river that's deep enough and big enough that a sink tip or a sinking line makes sense. But I typically will fish a four, five, or a six weight during the winter months. So let's talk about some of my top flies. These are the flies that typically yield me success when I'm fishing rivers in the winter. And I'm gonna look down at my notes here because I can't remember all and I wanna make sure I hit them all. So the beadhead TJ hooker, that's one of my go-to flies. I just like the design of it. It looks super fishy and it's a confidence fly for me because I've caught a lot of fish on the TJ hooker. Varying sizes, I like to sometimes, just depending on, I'll experiment when I'm prospecting. I typically tie on a very large fly to start off with, and sometimes I'll go more towards a medium fly. The bead-headed Pat's rubber leg can also work really well in the winter. Another, and this is called the turd and the worm, typically my dropper when I'm fishing that particular setup is a pink San Juan worm. And there's one particular worm that just works really well. And the only place I've been able to find it lately is Red's Fly Shop. They have this particular worm, typically in stock, but is a pink worm with a little bit of tinsel and a bead head. That has just been super effective when fishing rivers in the winter time. Jig leeches, and I typically go with the smaller sizes. Black and olive are kind of my go-to patterns on those jig leeches. Zebra midges, even though I really don't like fishing these tiny little flies, a lot of times you'll see these little midge hatches that'll come up on rivers during the winter time. And a lot of times the fish are right below there eating the larva state, which are these little zebra midges. And typically it's in black or red. Really small fly. Again, I don't like fishing those flies because they are so tiny, but sometimes you gotta tie it on, right? Because that's, that's what they wanna eat. And small little glow bugs. So I don't typically, well, I don't ever use split shot. I would rather get down deeper by just using a heavier bead or even a tungsten bead. It's just my preference. Anytime you put split shot onto the line, you're gonna damage the line. A lot of times I just think, last thing I wanna do is hook into that big fish and I lost it because the split shot has kind of damaged my line and it breaks right at the split shot. So I typically I just go with a heavier bead fly. Did you know that a white fish can lay almost 7,000 eggs per pound of fish in rivers. It's incredible. And they lay those eggs in November, December, and January. So a lot of times my dropper during those months is that little egg because the fish key in on them, right? There's so many, there's so much of that protein in the rivers that the fish will key in on those. So at times I'll have that TJ hooker and I'll have a little egg dropper because there's so many different eggs in that system with, uh, especially if you have a healthy system that has mountain whitefish in it. All right, so let's move over to the springtime, right? It's starting to warm up. Now the one challenge potentially you can get into when fishing springtime is runoff. If you live in some of the mountain states, as soon as it really starts to warm up in mid to late spring, it's gonna be tough to fish the rivers because generally the water levels are a lot higher when snow starts to melt and during the full runoff, it's almost impossible. Water clarity is terrible. It can be dangerous because the river flows are so high, but an early spring can be very rewarding as well as later spring when the runoff starts to subside. So some of the techniques that I use during these times, again, we're back to the indicator that can be very effective, fishing nymphs. Now, fish are more active, water's warming up. You could get into some dry flies as well. So. Pay attention again on what's happening. A lot of times the reason why you see me with two fly rods on me at any given time is I want to be able to do a quick change setup. I might have a nymph rig running on one rod and then have a dry fly or a streamer setup on another rod so I can do a quick setup based off of what I'm seeing that's happening on the river during the springtime. So pay attention, but a lot of times indicator fishing can be very successful, dry fly fishing, and streamers, right? If you're not in the streamer game, you are missing out because it is a ton of fun when you're throwing those streamers out because it's none of that technical things that you have to think about when fly fishing. You're just basically throwing out a big piece of meat and stripping it in. And in the springtime, it's a lot faster presentation and the fish just come up and blast it. And 
trust me, when you're streamer fishing, you're going to miss probably 60% of the strikes. That's normal. You're not doing anything wrong. And another reason why I like using the Sculpzilla is the hook is at the back of the fly, and that increases your chance of hooking up with the fish when it goes by and just blasts it. So you're going to miss a lot of fish during streamers. And again, I'm using floating line, longer leaders with streamers, sink tips, and full sink lines, depending on how deep and fast the water's running in the springtime. So the weight of rods that I typically use in the springtime, now I do like bringing the three weight for some of the smaller patterns and smaller dry patterns that might be happening. Four, five, and six weights typically are the weights of fly rods that I use during the springtime. So again, dry flies start happening, right? Blue wing olives, you wanna make sure you have those in your box. PMDs are always good to have in your box. Caddis, variable sizes. Those bugs, water's warming up, the bugs are starting to come up out of the mud or if they're attached to rocks, they're coming up, right? So pay attention, you're gonna get into some dry fly action during the spring as well. One of my favorite times is during the squalla hatch. These are really big bugs and can be a ton of fun to catch. So keep an eyeball out on what's flying around because you could get into some really epic dry fly hatches during the springtime months. Jig leeches can be very effective. The TJ Hooker and Pat's rubber leg again. Remember, those nymphs can live in the waters up to two years. So they're, they're always a chance to catch a fish on that particular nymph under an indicator. Woolly buggers can be effective. Sculpzilla, right? I love that pattern for, for uh, bait fish. Parachute Adams, they imitate mayfly patterns. And a lot of times that's, there's a lot of different stages of mayfly. There's a lot of different sizes of mayfly. There can be a lot of different colors of mayfly. The Parachute Adams really is a great all around fly for imitating mayfly. It also does a pretty good job with imitating some caddis as well. So it's kind of a nice general fly for both mayfly and caddis. Emergers, right? There was a time on one of my favorite rivers, the fish were just coming up and sipping and I could see these bugs sitting right at the surface of the water and they, these fish were eating them as the bugs were coming up and hatching and getting ready to fly away. That's essentially the emerging uh, they're emerging on the top of the water. So you want to have some emergers with you as well. And a lot of times, if you match the right size, you're going to get the fish to eat, especially if they're really active and going after pretty much anything that's floating by. Squalla stone flies and squalla dry. We talked about that earlier. Pheasant tail nymphs can be also very effective. And I like those in variable sizes. A lot of times I like the pheasant tail flashbacks, just get a little more flashy. But I use those flies often in my double rig setup in the springtime. All right, so let's talk about summer, fishing summer in rivers. One of my favorite times to fish is right there in the early summer months, right? The water levels are coming down. It's warm out. A lot of times you can wet wade. You don't need waders. I just love fishing the summer months. And this is when the big terrestrials come out, right? You've heard of the hopper dropper rig. That could be so effective during the summer months. Put on a great big hopper and really anything big and gaudy will work really well. I've got some patterns that I typically use that I've had a lot of success with. They're my confident hopper patterns, which are in this document, by the way. But really, any hopper, big foam hopper pattern can work real well. And the foamier ones do better for the dropper setups because they're more buoyant keeping. If you're using a small bead headed dropper, it just keeps everything up above the water and doesn't drag your hopper down. But a lot of times these fish, presentation isn't quite as important because typically these hoppers, right, they don't they don't fall onto the river and just kind of sit there and float down. They're scurrying around, they're moving around. So sometimes you'll get a fish just by moving it and all of a sudden it freaks the fish out and they come in and blast it. So hopper fishing can be so much fun in rivers during the summer. And typically I always have a dropper just for that fish that may not want to come up and eat that hopper, but they might eat a nymph as it's passing by. Streamers can also be very effective during the summer months. A lot of times these fish are really active. And if you can get a streamer into a cut bank or in and around big rock and zoom it by, a lot of times that triggers that little thing in their brain that they need to chase that down and eat it. So streamers can be also very effective during the summer months. Now you do need to pay attention to water temps, right? There is a certain water temp. I would encourage you to go after some warm water species. Leave the trout alone because they can really stress them out. If it gets too warm, the water has less oxygen. This fish can really struggle if you're fishing in the warmer months and the river temperatures have gone up significantly. Go after a bass and that is so much fun on a fly rod until those water temperatures cool down. So what are some of the flies that I recommend? terrestrials, right? There, there are a lot of different terrestrials, but I've got a list here of certain terrestrials that I trust that are confidence flies for me. 
from Chernobyl Ants, Hopper Patterns, Chubby Chernobyls. The reason why I like Chubby Chernobyls, they're really easy to see, right? They're huge and they're super buoyant. You put a little of that fly egg around that particular chubby and that thing is good for the rest of the day. It's not gonna sink. So it's a great stimulator pattern for the summer months. Smaller terrestrials too, don't forget about beetles. A lot of times I tie on a sparkle beetle when maybe they're not as interested in the big hoppers or you don't hear that typical sound that happens when you hear hoppers flying around. Tie on a smaller beetle, a lot of times you'll find some success as well. Mahogany duns in the morning, purple haze. I love fishing that purple haze fly. It's a little caddis, caddis fly. It's just, I don't know whether it's tied for the fly fisherman or not, but that purple haze has always done really well for me uh, during the summer morning time months. The gray wolf can be super effective, and I fish those both medium and larger size. I do typically tend to go with larger flies in the summertime because a lot of times those fish are just looking for the bigger meal. The Madam X, the Madam X, I've had some epic days on rivers using the Madam X in red. Again, it's another one of my confidence flies, but I would definitely encourage you to have that in your box. Pheasant tail nymphs for droppers. I've used rainbow warriors for droppers, can be real effective. Beadhead flashbacks for droppers, right? And really, the smaller the better because it's not going to pull the fly down and it just gives you that little extra chance of catching a fish if they happen to ignore your hopper that's going by and maybe leave the nymph so it just increases your chances to be fishing with two flies sparkle minnows can be super effective too especially when it's really bright out and you need to and really entice that fish to bite a lot of times a flashier fly can work better on brighter days uh, a little later later in the day as well and i've had a lot of success with sparkle minnows so the fall season really is one of my favorite times to fish one the colors right the trees are starting to turn if you're in an area that has larches the larches are turning this bright yellow against the evergreen trees that are behind it it's just a beautiful time to fish a lot of times the water levels as long as the rains haven't come in in a huge way the water levels are really good because snow is starting to build into the mountains and the water clarity and levels are just really at their at their best during the fall season. It'd be so much fun. What's cool about the fall is a lot of what worked really well in the summertime will carry over in early fall. I'll still be throwing a hopper in big terrestrial patterns, even though we've had a freeze, right? The hoppers are gone. A lot of times the fish are still keyed in on those big dry flies. So I have caught really nice fish with hoppers in early November. So I would encourage you to still throw a driver once in a while just to see what happens. And a lot of times you might be surprised a fish will come up and eat it. October caddis, right? You've all heard of that. It's a big, big caddis pattern, can be super effective when that hatch happens in and around October, late October. Sometimes it extends in November, just depending on where you're at and how cool the fall is. I don't know what it is, but the red copper john has always done well for me, either in a dropper setup or a second nymph setup on a double rig in the fall months. Don't ask me why. But the Red Copper John has always been one of my go-tos. So you're back to using double nymph rigs again under indicators. You are swinging with, with sculpzillas and, and, big, uh, and big streamer patterns because, again, the fish know, right, winter's coming. They need to fatten up. And a lot of times they are eating voraciously, going after bait fish, going after pretty much anything that floats by. And that's another reason why I love fishing the fall months is because the fish are just actively eating to try to get ready, right? And their brains know it's gonna get cold. It's gonna be harder to find food. It's not gonna be as much bug activity. So I'm gonna eat myself and become super fat just before the winter months. So a lot of times streamer patterns, the same type, the jig leeches can be very effective. Sculpin patterns can be very effective during the fall months. So a lot of times I put the three weight away now because I am going with bigger patterns, more aggressive stripping and things like that. And I'm typically using a four, five or six weight during the fall months. So one of the coolest thing too about fishing the fall months, and it's cool, but it also kind of screw up the fishing. There are a couple of creeks in my neck of the woods that, especially during the pink, the pink season, which is every other year, holy smokes, the river just becomes packed full of spawning salmon. It's fun to see, it kind of messes up the fishing. A lot of times you gotta go up higher into the system to find the trout, because I have found whenever the salmon are in, in rivers in that, when there's that many salmon in the rivers, the trout are just, yeah, they're just kind of turned off by that. They're put off. They're not gonna be as eating as readily as they would have when the salmon are in there. But it certainly is cool to be fishing some of your favorite rivers and seeing these salmon coming up. So that kind of covers what to use and what to look for and some of the techniques that work for me 
during each season of the year fish and rivers and again i've got over 20 pages right here that list even we even talk about the different types of rivers when you're fishing tailwaters when you're fishing freestone rivers when you're fishing smaller creeks larger streams gives you some tips and tricks on what to look for when fishing those big or those type of streams and it's again a culmination of everything that i've learned over the 40 years i put down on paper it just kind of helps you you know have more success when you're fishing those type of streams so how do you get this be part of the group i started a club it's an online club it continues to grow continues to evolve and again thanks to bill for inspiring this and if you're a part of if you're a club club member then you get to have a pdf version of this emailed to you so that you can always have it it's a good read and kind of it'll help inspire you when you're out there and perhaps find some success the next time you're out there in the winter fall spring summer months fishing your favorite river and i'll put a video right here that kind of describes what this club is all about and thank you to the members that have joined appreciate you and if you're considering joining thanks so much all right everybody till the next time fish on hello there thank you so much for clicking that join button i appreciate the fact that you are considering being part of this fly fishing club so what are some of the perks that you'll enjoy by being a part of this group First, you are gonna get to see all the videos that I upload, all the long format videos I upload before anyone else does on YouTube. You get exclusive sneak peeks to fishing trips, tutorials, whatever it might be, you're gonna see it first. I'm also going to make exclusive content just for you. Won't be seen anywhere else on YouTube, only if you're part of this family, this, this group, right? It's exclusively for you your comments and questions on those videos will get top priority. You ask me a question, I'm gonna be sure to answer every question that every member gives me gets an answer. So you have a closer connection to me by being a part of this group. Also, you have the opportunity to let me know what video you want me to make. That's right, I will make you a video on request. If you wanna see something covered when it comes to fly fishing, I'll cover it for you because I've got a lot of information stuck up in this brain. And sometimes I need a little help coming up with ideas. Being a part of this group, you basically get to pretty much request any video that you'd like me to do and I'll do that for you. Also, we're gonna be doing once a month, we're gonna be doing live streams. Now this is where it'll either be you and I enjoying a beer together or a cup of coffee, depending on what time, but we're all gonna sit down together once a month for an hour or 90 minutes, and I'm just gonna answer any questions that you might have in the moment. So, and remember, this is also a safe place, a safe space. As you know, online, right, can be can be rough, rough in places. Part of what I have tried to do with this YouTube channel is spread positivity and kindness in this world. And this is really what this fly fishing club, this fly fishing group is about. If you're gonna be a part of this family, it's going to be nothing but spreading positivity and kindness. So no question is a dumb question. I want you to feel free to answer, ask any question that you might have about fly fishing, and it's a safe place to do so. And as group members, you'll be able to interact with each other, whether it's on a video or a live stream as well. So thank you again for considering being a part of this group. Oh, and I almost forgot you are gonna have the opportunity to save on some of the premium gear that I represent, which includes my own fly rod company. That's right, you'll be able to save on some of the FFD fish on fly rods that Neil and I build on a weekly, monthly basis. So you'll have exclusive savings on a lot of these premium brands, including the fly rods that no one else will have access to. So that is a pretty big perk that you'll have being a part of this family, this club, this community. And finally, you will be supporting me as a creator, as a teacher, as a fly fisher. You may or may not know, it does take a ton of money to do what I do, whether it's the time that I spend or the money that it takes to be able to get to some of these fly fishing destinations. You are supporting me personally as a creator, as a fly fisher, as a teacher, by being a part of this community. So thank you so much in advance. And I appreciate that because it will help me continue what I'm doing today on YouTube and putting out this content that you love. So thank you so much for your consideration. And I hope that you decide that you wanna join this group and I'll see you on the other side.
Thank you again. And until the next time, fish on. There we go. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a nice fish. Holy crap. Hello there. Thanks for taking the time to tune into this video. One of my favorite things, and I don't know if it's yours or not, but one of my favorite things about fishing in the winter time is that generally when you pull up to your favorite spot, the parking lot is completely empty. And when you walk to your favorite fishing hole, there's nobody here. One of my favorite, all time favorite things about bearing the cold and getting out there and fish. And I would encourage you to do the same. Today, I have a couple of setups with me. I got my five weights. FFD5, I've got a turd in the worm. And what that is, it's basically a big stonefly TJ hooker and a worm dropper on an indicator. I'm gonna run it through this hole behind me to see if there's anything there. It's a great setup for the winter. And then also drop, brought my trout spay with just a Sculpzilla, right? Would you expect anything else? So let's see if we can pull a nice fish out of this hole. All right, let's do this, fish home. Right, you can kind of see how the water is kind of rushing in here and then it slows down. Nice inside seam there, outside. And if it was sunny out, you'd be able to see there's a huge color change, right? It goes from kind of a light emerald to a deep emerald. That's because there's a drop off there. A lot of times there's fish hanging on, hanging out there in the drop off. So I'm gonna throw it up in kind of the fast current and let it drop off. I'm gonna start off with probably four or five feet from the first fly just to start prospecting this hole to see if there's any fish there. So that's kind of the strategy that I'm using um, going after these fish. So, line's cold, it's never, never quite wants to work right. Oh, well, quick pro tip when fishing the winter, and especially if you got snow on the ground, Get rid of the felts, right? Corkers has these river spikes that work really well in cold weather. It gives you great traction in the river and great traction in the snow and you're not falling on your face whenever you're walking to the hole or walking around ice. So I'd recommend you getting some of those. And if you have corkers, I'll leave a link down in the description if you wanna check those out for yourself. All right, let's get back to fishing. Another big reason why I like fly fishing in the winter is because if I think back, I think it's been two years now, two years ago, I had an amazing experience on the same river. Oh, there we go. Fish on. Oh, oh, going. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that guy took off. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh my God, Kobe. This is a good fish. Oh, holy sh <laughs> Oh, wow. It's like a, yeah, I guess so. Holy shit, he took the, oh, what? Holy crap. Oh my God, <laughs> holy crap. It's like a steelhead. Oh, look at this thing. Oh, oh, oh. That's freaking huge. <laughs> wow. So let's hope that lightning will strike twice in a two year span, something like that. Let's hope I get another big one like that one. That'd be pretty cool. There we go. Oh, nice. 
Woo! Got 4X tippet on. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, that's a nice fish. Holy crap. Wow. That is a really nice fish. Try not to fall on my face. Holy smokes, that is a big rainbow. God, that looks like a steelhead. Oh, wow, what a beautiful rainbow. Oh my God, that's huge. Look at the size of that fish. Sheesh. Seriously, look at the size of this fish. Freaking huge, huge, <laughs> oh yeah, fish on. So quick tip for you when you're casting these big double nymph setups with an indicator, water load. You'll find that you'll have far less tangles if you use that casting technique, casting these multi-fly setups out there. So water load and you'll have a much better experience. All right, time to get out the trout spay. Rest this hole for a while. See if there's anything in there that might want to come out and eat. Since I'm swinging, I'm going to walk up just a little bit higher on the hole and swing through the sweet spots. How's it going? It is. Yeah, you do it, man. Yeah, good, good. We've been doing the, uh, the Euro transition to Spay all on a all on a three weight Euro rock. Nice. We're having you know decent success. It, the the fish were just pounding like pink worms. Okay, yeah. It came up and came back down, but yeah, man. How's it been going in here? Ah, uh, you know, I caught one little one here. I was up above. Okay. Uh, to start the day, and I caught probably a 20, 21 inch fish on the pink worm. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then I'm trying the trout spay. I completely suck at it. That's why I'm overhead casting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I just can't seem to get it right. So. <laughs> yes, yes. But I've had a, I've had a couple on, you yeah. know. But uh, for whatever reason, I just can't stay hooked up. I've landed like two fish on the trout spay and probably hooked up 12 times. Okay. Okay. So well, today in particular, they're, they're pretty grabby, but not like eating it hard. And there'll be days like that. Um, the only thing that I suggest with the trout spay, if people are losing a lot of like or hooking up and not 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 getting them set, it's such a long rod, right? And it's different than a euro setup. Um, uh, but you still need to keep a lot of tension on that thing. Mm -hmm. And and rather than keep that rod low, I like to keep a trout spay rod higher. Okay. Because that sink tip is going to bring that fly in. <clears throat> and, and, and it's going to keep that fish's face lower. We lose a lot of our fish when their face comes up and they and they shake loose there. So the what I usually teach is let the sink tip, if you're fishing a sink tip, let that keep the fish's uh, face down, but you just keep tension. Oh, okay. You lose tension on that thing. All right. Yeah, yeah. Rod high with a sink tip. I, I think so. I, Got it. I, I kept them on a little bit more than that, but yep, yep. Cool. Awesome, well, man. Good to see you again. Good to man. see you too, Jason. See ya. Thanks for all the uh, videos. Yeah. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Appreciate it. All right, fish on, guys. There we go. Rod high. Taking Jason's advice from Red Fly Shop. See if I can actually land one. Sweet. Thank you, Jason. I finally landed. I finally landed a fish. 
on the spay rod. Nice. That's pretty cool when you run into Jason from Red's Fly Shop on the river and he gives you some advice and then you use that advice and land a fish not but five minutes later. So thanks Jason, I appreciate it. And if you guys haven't ever been down to Red's Fly Shop down in the canyon, you need to. It's a great shop, that's where I'm gonna have dinner tonight. And just, you know, destination place for sure. Something you need to check out if you're out here in the canyon. All right, I'm cold, I'm hungry. I had a great day, thanks for joining me. Something special about winter fishing. I'd encourage you to get out there and do some yourself. All right, everybody, till the next time, fish home. Well, hello there. Thanks for taking the time to click on this video. I do appreciate it. And if you clicked on this video, see what's in my hand right here? These are steelhead flies specifically for spay rods. You wanna know a little bit more about spay fishing for steelhead. We're gonna talk about the rod options for you, reel options for you, line options for you, flies for you, even some tips and techniques on reading water. And we're even gonna name a few popular spots here in Washington State that you can go get your spay rod steelhead fishing on. So with a snap of a finger, Let's get ourselves over to the Puget Sound Fly Shop. Hey Matt, what is spay fishing and how does it differ from other fly fishing techniques? So spay fishing, you're using two-handed rods. Um, they have compact, would be your shorter style, um, up to you know your longer rods, um, which extend. Uh, a lot of people like 14 footers, things like that. Your average spay guy is gonna be using roughly around you know, your 13.3, 13.6 uh, spay rods is kind of the general. It's gonna be either in a seven or an eight way. That's kind of your all arounder. Hey Matt, when is the best time of year to spay fish for steelhead? Best time of year for steelhead is winter time. So we're looking around, probably around now till March for the winter run. Um, it's a great time of year to be out there fishing in the first place for steelhead. Uh, this is kind of that perfect time of year for it. You know, um, even though it's cooler out, it doesn't affect the fish. Hey Matt, what type of spay rod should I get if I want to take up spay fishing for steelhead? So for your spay rods, you're going to be looking at your G Loomis IMX Pros over here um, that they have, or their V2s. Um, and then they have the NRX Pluses as well in your G Loomis. Then you're going to pop on over here to your OPST rods. A great rod especially if you're a compact spay guy um, as well as your echo and reddington rods it's uh the reddington claymore is a great great price point um if you're looking to just get into spay and if you're a little more advanced i would be looking at the Sa sage sonic um that's probably one of my favorite spay rods that are out hey matt what type of spay reel do i need to use if i'm going to pick up spay fishing if you're looking for a spay reel um you know i suggest you know, looking at a closed cage, lamps and guru, always a good option. And then you kind of get into your hardy cascopedia and getting into these guys right here. You know, having that closed cage really nice for when you're using running line um, and that from that skipping, um, that's what they were basically built for. So you have that thinner running line. It's not going to go ahead and basically pop out, jam up. You're going to lose your fish. What's the price point? So price point starting off at about three fifty nine, dollars um, And those basically go up a ways. Um, it just depends on what kind of reel you're looking at. Lamson makes some good reels. Um, they do have a price point. You're looking at a remix that they have in a closed cage. I believe those are about 229, somewhere around there. Um, great entry level uh, spay reel. Hey Matt, is there a special kind of fly line that I need to use for spay casting for steelhead? All right, if you follow me on over here, I'll go ahead and show you some lines. So Skagit lines. Um, it's going to be depending on head length of what you're trying to do and accomplish in your um, spay adventures. Rio Skagit Max Power and Launch, great, great lines to go ahead and be fishing. Then you got the Airflow, which one of my favorite is the Rage Compact, as well as the Skagit Driver up here. They just cast really well, one's a little longer overhead, um, depending on your casting style and 
how you anchor, anchor your cast or your flies um, can kind of depend, or depending on what water you're gonna be in. If you're gonna be in smaller stuff, having that compact is gonna be a little easier for you to control. And I also have OPST lineup over here. I have all of their winter for steelhead heads over here. I have their tips running line. Um, this is also a really great option. They really have the spay game dialed in. Hey Matt, where are some places that I can go spay fishing for steelhead? So some great spots to go ahead and especially start your adventure into, into spay fishing. Um, the Cat River at Blue there's a nice open area for you to kind of learn. You're not dealing with a lot of stuff behind you, so you can really work on your cast there. Another great spot that's super productive or spots would be the Olympic Peninsula, and we're gonna be getting a year this year. So far, they're saying we're getting a season to March. So one of my favorite spots is the um, Go up by the hatchery, go fiddle around up there. You know, there's usually plenty of fish. Um, you want a more nostalgic area, go to the river, stop in a always a good run to go swing. That whole area, good bars to fish. You know, and that's where you're gonna find a lot of your winter run steelhead. Hey Matt, what are some tips on reading water when fishing for steelhead? And what are some etiquette things that I should consider? Some tips for uh, going out um, and spay fishing and reading water is you're looking for walking pace water. Most of those fish are gonna be sitting on that inside seam through that nice run coming on, coming on through. Look for walking pace water. That's where they like to sit. They don't like to sit in the fast current. They wanna sit in that nice, easy, easy water right there. A perfect example is actually Blue Creek up at the top. It comes in, nice walking pace water. You can go in and fish that, a lot of hookups. So tips, or I should say fishing etiquette. Um, you know, you just gotta remember, you're, you're swinging. So your room that you kinda need, you're not, you can't stack up on each other. You need to be a little ways down. And so what you wanna do in a run, especially if there's other people there, Make your cast, swing through, and then take two steps down. And you wanna do that as you go ahead and progress down that run. Now, everybody else behind you that's doing it, hopefully they're doing the same thing. And then you can pop up top and you can redo that run. Ask on the river if somebody's up above and you're like, hey, can I go ahead and go below you a ways? Always ask, don't just do it. That's how bad things happen on the river. Hey Matt. <laughs> what what flies do you, should you consider when steelheading? And I also notice that you appear to have some hand-tied stuff here. I do have some hand-tied stuff. So uh, it's kind of known as the mat rabbit. It's a great leech pattern. Um, it's a good searcher pattern as well. Um, so you can't really go wrong just in general with leech patterns. Um, usually for your winter time, throw in patterns or a pattern that's like that. Um, works really well. It has a lot of movement in it with that trailing hook that's on there. As well as if you're, you know, fishing a little shallower stuff, you got hobo spays, so they're unweighted. Um, another great choice. My first ever steel that I caught was on the hobo spay green butt skunks right there. You're just looking for some of these patterns to go ahead and pop. So having these stew protruders, great option to go ahead and have out there. Um, always something to have in your quiver as well as sometimes it's, it works even better than these, you know, these more newer flies. You can always go traditional with some undertakers, some polar shrimps, green butt skunks, traditional. They work really well. You know, they're not all, all gaudy and flashy, but they are tried and true flies that have always worked. Hey Matt, what other equipment do I need if I'm gonna start up spay fishing for steelhead? What are some of the other things that you need to hook me up with? So, on top of the line that we were kind of just going over, you're gonna need tips. This is kind of a, this is kind of what comes together, what brings your spay fishing together, um, is these sink tips. They also make floating as well. Um, this is kind of an example of what you're kind of looking for. Your, your normal person, that spay fishes is gonna have a T8, a T11, and a T14, and it's gonna be about 10 feet of it. Um, all companies basically make this type of thing with different variations as well, but this is the most kind of common that you're gonna go to. If you're doing OPST, you're gonna have the Riffle Run and Bucket Series. If you like uh, Rio, it's gonna be your Mo Series, and Airflow, it's gonna be your Poly Leaders. 
poly leaders are pretty nice if you're trying to be a little more delicate. Um, also, you know, it is tapered, so casting wise, it, it's, it's pretty nice, pretty easy. It's not super heavy. So that's the nice part about the poly leaders. So these are something that you're gonna need to put on the end of your, of your Skagit head to your tip. And then you're gonna put, I like to do about four feet of tippet, depending on, so between 12 and let's say 20 pounds is kind of what you're gonna be kind of looking at. How do I know which tip to put on? So you're gonna be looking at water. So let's say water levels, you know, are super high or you're fishing into a deep bucket. That's where that T14 comes into play. It's gonna get you down where you need to be into that feeding zone. Now, that normal, what I'm fishing is T11, unless the water is, is low. If the water's lower, you're gonna be looking at T8. And that's kind of gonna be your go-to. Um, but once again, you get back to that T14 and that's when you're fishing that for deep buckets, fast water, it'll get you down to where you need to be. So it's probably smart to have multiple tips with you at any given time. Yes, it is. Uh, you'll be able to adjust and that's the nice part. You can go ahead and be like, hey, I need to get down further or hey, I need to be up off the bottom. Um, and that's where having different tips come into play. So you're not dealing with multiple lines. Now you're dealing with multiple tips and they make tip wallets for that reason. So you can go ahead and store those in there as well. And you have all your tips in one little, one little uh, package. Do you have those here? I do. Can I see one? Yes. Nice. Several to choose from. Nice. I just want to let everybody know that I have do discounts, 10% discount for first responders, active duty and veterans. So come on in and uh, every single purchase you make, you get your discount off of if uh, you fall under one of those three. Fish on. Man, that thing is bright. It's almost as good as the LED indicator. There we go. Nice. Nice. Yay. So I have something super cool to share with you. You know, Oros indicators, they stepped into the market about three years ago now, I think. One of the best innovations in indicators since, I don't know when, since, since the bobber, right? Since the bobber. Oros indicators, the line goes right down the center and then the two half spheres screw together anywhere on the line so you don't get any of those tangles. It doesn't twist your line. It doesn't chafe your line. It doesn't dent your line. I mean, they really are a pretty cool indicator. Well, they have come out now with a fluorescent color, which I love, really pops. It's kind of a chartreuse, a fluorescent char chartreuse. And they now have these tiny little indicators. So some of the feedback that I've seen is that their smallest isn't quite small enough for some of the midges or like tiny little chironomids. You might be fishing in a very select fishery that anything and everything scares the fish. So now they have the very small size of oral syndicator. And they were kind enough to send me a box and can't wait to use them. Right now we're fishing a lake that that's just, it's too small for this particular fishery, but I'm sure I'll be at a spot to where I'll try these things out in the short, short term. So if you're looking for an ultra small indicator, check out Orals. They're also kind of marshmallow shaped. It just makes it a little easier to handle when you're unscrewing and screwing together because they are so tiny. So good on you, Orals. And thank you so much for sending those along. And uh, all right, till the next time, fish on. The four biggest mistakes that anglers make when trying to choose one of these. And this is a fly rod. The first mistake is that you don't choose the right weight of fly rod. Mistake number two is that you don't choose the right length of fly rod. Mistake number three is that you don't take in consideration the speed or action of the fly rod that you're thinking about purchasing. And the fourth, we'll talk about it at the end of the video, but it is an important one and worth sticking around for. So in this video, we're gonna talk about those four things 
and I'm gonna help better your experience the next time you go into your local fly shop or from a family operated and owned local fly rod builder and you wanna buy one of these fly rods. I've been doing this now for 40 years. I've made some mistakes along the way and I hope to be able to correct some of those or inform you of some of the mistakes that I have made so that you can make a better informed decision for yourself when you make, at times, a pretty significant investment when it comes to one of these fly rods. So with that being said, you do get what you pay for when selecting one of these fly rods. Don't select your fly rod based off of price. That is a mistake that we didn't list, but I wanted to start off by saying that first. If you go for the cheapest thing on the market, you are likely not going to have a very good experience and you may give up on the sport altogether. So making an investment in a fly rod, you do get what you pay for. Fly rods can range anywhere from zero to 14 weight. If you're using a 14 weight, you're probably going after several hundred pound fish. You're gonna need a bigger boat. But most of you watching are probably going after trout, so we'll kind of stick in that window. So the weights that you want to look at if you're trout fishing are three all the way up to about an eight weight for trout. And you're going after some pretty darn big trout in some big waters if you're using an eight weight. Typically, you're gonna use either a three, four, five, or six weight if you're going after trout. The weight of a fly rod essentially refers to how strong and how big that fly rod is. So like this here, right here, this rod is a seven weight fly rod. This fly rod is a lot bigger and stronger than a three weight. You would not wanna go after giant Lahontan cutthroats with a three weight rod. One, you're not gonna be able to cast big heavy flies with that three weight, and the fish will probably destroy that rod. So you want something that's bigger or a higher weight if you're going after larger fish. Typically, if you're trout fishing, and if, especially if you're just starting out, a five weight is the perfect size fly rod to start off with. So, I hope that makes sense. Number two, the length of the fly rod, right here. This particular fly rod that I'm holding is nine feet in length. Why is length important? Length gives you leverage. The longer the fly rod, the easier it is to cast. Now that is true in most cases. Typically, if you're buying a three weight, that is in a lesser length because you're not trying to shoot the fly out 60, 70 feet with a three weight. You're generally fishing smaller streams. You need a shorter rod because maybe you have trees and branches over your head and a nine footer wouldn't work in the application. But again, if you're doing just basic trout fishing, a nine foot rod is where you wanna start. Some anglers make the mistake of going with a shorter, like a seven and a half or eight foot fly rod when they first start out, and it is tougher to cast than a nine foot rod. You just, again, have more leverage when picking up that line, you have a longer rod, which allows you to reach longer distances. So I would definitely start out with a nine foot rod if you're just getting started with fly fishing. All right, so now let's talk about the action of a fly rod. Another mistake that people do when buying a fly rod is they buy the wrong action of a fly rod. You wanna ask those questions because there are a lot of fly rods out there that are made with a fast action type of action. What the action essentially is, is where the rod bends, right, during a cast. If the rod bends from the tip to about a third of the way down and the rest of this rod stays pretty stiff, that's a faster action rod. Now, the biggest challenge with that is that if your timing isn't perfect using a fast action rod, a lot of people have a lot of trouble, especially if you're relatively new with fly fishing, it's not easy to cast a fast action fly rod. The timing has gotta be perfect to be able to load that fly rod up properly and shoot the line out. Now, if you want kind of the best of both worlds, that is a moderately fast action rod. A moderately fast action rod, it will bend further into the blank so you have a lot of energy transfer from fly rod to fly line and the recovery time from that fly rod from bending 
the straightening back out because that straightening back out is what delivers the energy that the fly rod just produced into the fly line. That is a better option for anyone that's newer to fly fishing because the technique doesn't have to be as perfect and the fly rod is far more forgiving with a moderately fast action rod. So that's what I would recommend to anyone that's new to fly fishing. And part of the reason why I designed my own fly rod with a medium or a moderate fast action blank is because these things really are easier to cast. Okay, so now let's talk about number four. Number four, one of the biggest mistakes people make when purchasing a fly rod is they don't marry that perfect fly rod up with the right fly line. Fly line does make a difference. You can have the easiest casting fly rod ever built, and if you marry it up with a crappy fly line, you're not gonna have the same experience. A lot of new anglers, especially new anglers that buy those kits, that generally does not have a very good fly line on it. And when you get out there and you're starting to cast and it's not performing like you hope, you're getting piles of spaghetti in front of you, you feel like you're doing everything right. <laughs> That's because, unfortunately, you have a crappy fly line. I know it can seem expensive. I mean, when you're looking at fly lines that are 60 to $120, that's expensive for a fly line, but it really does make a huge difference when casting one of these fly rods. It really does. So invest in the fly line and you're gonna have a much better experience. All right, so thanks for joining me today on this video. And until the next time, go get yourself a new fly rod and fish on. All right, you live in the Puget Sound and you wanna fly fish for sea run cutthroat. So what do you need? So you might want to get a pair of waders, but typically I wear boots because a lot of the beaches that I'm fishing are a pretty steep drop off. So I don't really need to wade out that far, but there are places to wear waders or hip boots might be more ideal. You're going to need a stripping basket. Otherwise your line's going to get wrecked really quick. So get a stripping basket. I have a really light one from, uh, what is this? I'm trying to read it upside down. Is that coastal? Deep coastal? Well, I'll give it, I'll give it a shot there. But it's, it's really nice and lightweight and it keeps the line off your feet and getting tangled up in the rocks and sticks and seaweed and everything else. You need at least a five weight. So this is my own, this is the FFD5. I was actually kind of curious to see how it was gonna do with, sea, uh, with the Sea Run Cutthroat Fishery. And I'm pleasantly surprised that with this medium fast action rod, it is getting this popper out there pretty easy. I got a remix reel and I've got an outbound short uh, put on this it's it's lined up so this is a six weight outbound short and it seems to be casting really actually really well i can shoot out the line with just one false cast and i'm shooting it out 60 feet really easy you want to find beaches that have a current if you don't have a current you're probably not going to catch any sea run cutthroat so find a place with the current you can use streamers i was using a streamer to start you got nothing and then i tied on this popper right here and had a fish and got another resident black mouth too which was kind of cool Came up and grabbed it. Oh, and he's off. Damn it. Lost the fish, but you know, that's that's part of it. I've got a net sitting on my pack. And by the way, you, you do want a pack. I've just got a little fanny pack that's waterproof. And I've got a little magnetic catch for my net. I've got some sunglasses, polarized, a hat, a sun shirt, because I don't like putting on sunscreen. Let's see, what else, what else do we have? You can get stripping guards, otherwise you start cutting into your fingers. I've got them. I was just too lazy to dig them out, so I wasn't using stripping guards. But once you've got all that, you're ready to go, right? And and there's a selection of flies from you know a lot of a lot of trout stuff works really well. But I've got this one particular fly from Spawn Flyfish. I don't know what it's called. It's peach with a bead head, but it's really effective. I've caught some fish in the past with it. But this popper is so much fun to see the fish come up and blast this popper. Oh, and you know, you do want to get, right, some people will fish an intermediate line, but you know, I've had great luck with just doing a floating line in this outbound short. So you can get an intermediate, but I, I think you're gonna probably get stuck on the bottom. And then lastly, you gotta pack your patience, right? You're, you're gonna be picking off seaweed from your flies, your line, pretty much everything all day long. So you do have to pack your patience when it comes to sea run cutthroat fishing. 
But other than that, find a beach with a current. Incoming tide is, is usually what I like to fish, but outgoing is good too, as long as you have some current and you'll get into some of these cool sea run cutthroat trout out here in the Puget Sound. Oh, almost forgot. I'm using 2X tapered leaders, which are about 10 pound test, and that's plenty. You can use 0X, 1X, or 2X. I wouldn't go any lighter than 2X. And the reason why I wouldn't go any lighter than 2X is because some of these flies you're using are pretty heavy and they'll snap off on the back cast. So you need a little heavier leader to be able to keep the flies attached. I got another pro fly fishing tip for you. Saltwater tip. When you're done with a fly, you're changing up, don't put it back in the box. You do that, it's gonna get the rest of them salty and you're gonna potentially have a whole bunch of rusty flies. So have a little container on all the flies you've used, put in that container so when you get home, you can rinse them off. And that really goes for any type of saltwater fly fishing. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate it, I almost dropped my rod. And if you need a little help with your cast, check out this video right here. I put a tutorial together, eight minutes. I promise you, you're gonna cast that line just a little bit further than you are today. All right, everybody, till the next time, fish on.